Hello there. I'm William Lewis, and I'll be your narrator for this documentary. We would like to take a moment here to dedicate this film to the pioneers who worked the Richardson counter up until 1994 when it literally dried up and died with Mr. John Richardson. And say thank you to the Richardson family who lent the world John Richardson, entrepreneurial spirited titan of the dried floral industry for over 60 years, farmer who never owned the land harvested, coon hunting fool, luckiest gambler that ever lived, and most importantly, friend of the piney. A person's impact on those around them is almost never felt by them, but only remembered when they pass from this earth, not while they breathe the same air as those that will soon come to judge them. A future without them, but shaped by them in the past. John Richardson was a part of America's dried flower industry, which the floral industry was practiced around the world. In 1879 book, Wonders of the Flora, the Preservation of Flowers by H. Acosta Creskin, an encounter is documented that took place at the 1865 grand opening of the International Horticulture Exhibition in Cologne on the Rhine River. Royal Highness Frederick William, Crown Prince of Prussia, while in the German city at the exhibition, stopped and spoke with Mr. Creskin, after which inspecting the dried flower displays said, In these preserved flowers, we have the beginnings of a future large branch of industry. In Europe at the time, the preservation of flowers for home decor, wants and needs, were already in full swing, and the United States had to catch up to the industry. Mr. Creskin added much to the construction of the dry floor industry in America. In the early 1930s, another man rose to the challenge, and he, John Jack Richardson, took the lead, expanding the market, and in doing so, helped hundreds of piney families live a better life in southern New Jersey. That last gasp of an industry that spanned over 150 years died with John Richardson in 1994, being replaced by trending fresh-cut flowers and artificial flowers of today. Walk with us through the pines in the 21st century. Each step, inhale and exhale, the smell of pine needles and pine resin causing your lungs to smile. Reaching out and touching a prickly pine cone reminds you Mother Nature has a specific design in mind when she created those brown balls. Inside of each are the seeds of tomorrow. Yet to grow another generation, most pitch pine trees need fire to loosen Mother Nature's glue. Resin, but once touched by fire, the cones unfurl, letting the winds carry tomorrow's seeds and continued life. Scientists will tell you Pine Barrens environment is rare and threatened in the United States. If you're from southern New Jersey or if you've visited the New Jersey Pinelands National Reserve, these pygmy pitch pine trees will look familiar. If you climb the Shawangunk Mountains of New York, you might think it was filmed there. But if you went to New York's other Pine Barren habitat over on Long Island, you'll probably experience deja vu because this is the Dwarf Pine Plains Preserve on Long Island. An ecological wonder of stunted pitch pine trees and scrub oak habitat. Yet the biggest and most magical place is a wee bit further south of New York State.
1988, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO for short, designated the largest Pine Barrens area located in New Jersey as a single site biosphere reserve or region, basically telling the world this is a magical place that warrants protection from habitat loss. Before that, in 1978, Congress established one of the first national reserves known as the Pinelands National Reserve, ultimately saving over 1.1 million acres from economic development, which was targeted for a new super jet port. What New Jersey has that none of the other Pine Barren regions can claim, besides the sheer mass of the Evergreen Sea, is a population of people that are known as Pineys. People of the Pines of Southern New Jersey, who lived close to the land and worked cyclical industries, such as dry floral, bog iron, glassworks, paper mills, cranberry, and later blueberry industries. A badge of honor used among the residents of the Pines and of those who have moved away who have close ties with the area, very similar to the culture and traditions that grew from geographically isolated places in the rural towns of the South along the Appalachian and Ozark Mountains, a thriving culture hidden in plain sight between two East Coast metropolises, Philadelphia and New York City. In my opinion, a piney is, so, is, a, is sort of like a birthright. You gotta have a, you gotta be a descendant of somebody that worked around these pines in the past. Maybe around cranberry bogs, even when they had these paper mills, glass factories, and cutting, making charcoal and jobs like that. They didn't intermangle with with the surrounding uh, suburban types. They just kept it ourselves. From the river to the bay, beloved by folks of yesteryear and those right here today. The pines along the Jersey shore seem to be the greenest here. The lakes with sparkling beauty bring us joy throughout the year.
Open Space, Many Places by Mary Hufford and the American Folklife Center in 1986, one of four charts depicting life of the piney. The knowledge these ponies had of the woods and how to make a living are oversimplified in the woodland's graph. Yet, it depicts the life of those ponies who practiced and lived by inherent woodmanship. This clip is from one of the interviews Mary did with Leo Landy, a proprietor of Piney Crafts, back on February 21st, 1983, at his place of business in Nesco, New Jersey. How about the cat's paw? Where's the... Cat's it, paw this, grows this what down... what you call cat's paw? That's the cat's paw. It grows okay. down in the swamp. Let him get a Cranberry picture ball. of that, too. Yeah. Okay. Um, excuse me. Oh, he's taking Does that have other names, too? We Pardon? don't know. We it don't probably know has a botanical name. That. Everything does, but we, that's the only thing we know. Pussy paw, cat's paw. From 1983 to 1986, Congress established a team to study the local traditions and culture and to aid planners in subsequent preservation efforts alongside the unique flora and fauna of the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. Depending on who you are, varies the opinion if the team was successful in such a lofty and difficult task. During the course of the project, Mary Hufford and her team often heard the same response when they asked local people about pineys. The only culture in the pines revolved around those out on the plains pulling pine cones or in Wharton State Forest cutting hog brush, the people who lived closest to the land. Maybe a bit of foreshadowing of the days spent wandering the hills of white sand standing above the pitch pine blanket of green filling a bucket with brown balls were truly numbered, adding to the misnomer that William Wasowicz was the last piney among us. Many of the pineys turned to the woods to carry on their traditions, even though it was forbidden after the lands became government owned. Here is an image of a stack of pine cones from a Tuckerton piney named Gary Driscoll. Listen to his voice filled of longing for the old days and his struggle at the end to continue to do what generations of locals did before him. Yep, they <laughs> used still to do. I used to do, yeah, you squat there and hit them up and, uh, you know, Wherever you could make 50 bucks, right? I'm going. <laughs> so yeah, we did that. It kind of just, uh, I don't, I don't. It was just, I don't know. It all just came crashing down uh, to the point where it just you just threw your hands up and said, "I guess I'm done," you know? Right. So it's yeah. something in part of your history. I know. It makes me so angry that. Uh, and I told my daughter, I said, you know, they actually took part of my heritage from me when they did this. You know, it just, it just upsets me. I, you know, if they said, you need a permit uh, to go do this stuff, I, hey, I'm willing to go, I'll, I'll buy a permit from the state. And just let me go do the thing that I used to do, you know. But uh, everybody knew and how hard it was to make a living. And, hey, you're out here trying to make 40 bucks, go for it, you know. You got your place, I got mine. Right. So, yeah, there's plenty up there for everybody. There was always, a, you know, and, 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 and every year they come back. I mean, the more you, it seemed to me like the more you, if, if you did snap a limb off, it just was actually pruning the tree. In my, my opinion, it was pruning it. Uh, there was no sap in the tree in the winter. So you just, you're snapping some limbs off. Okay, you break some limbs off. And, but the next year, the tree again is full of cones again. It's same loaded. area. You went to the same it's area year to year, right? Every year. Every and year. You, you did it from the 60s all the way up to the 80s. Every year. Almost to the 90s, so 40 yep. years. Yeah, and people did it long before 30. I did. Yeah. Get in the time machine and escape with us. Back to days gone by. Listen to some of the last woods pineys, or reluctant pineys, talk about old days at a secret site. Hidden away where time stands still and man's progress with his societal standards and his life of the 40-hour work week aren't welcome. Bill Wasowicz hosts a few who've walked the walk and talked the talk. Bill gives us his opinion on the myth of the Jersey Devil and so much more. Him and others pass the time sharing stories of yesterday, working in the woods, clinging to old traditions. In addition, see how author William J. Lewis struggles with his own piney roots. Hello everyone, uh, Bill Lewis here. Uh, I'm the author of uh, New Jersey's Lost Piney Culture. Uh, today with me, I have a gentleman sitting around uh, this kind of semicircle, the last remaining woods pineys. Uh, we're gonna talk about that and also the other nine types of pineys. 
These guys are representing the last few people alive that have been considered the woods pining or reluctant pining. The ones who generation after generation worked in the woods collecting pining craft items like those on the table over there. I bet some of you missed that feeling of being out in the pines and loving what you did day in and day out. It's hard work, I've experienced it myself, but you get used to it and even fall in love with it, right? Well, I'm hoping we can have a candid, unscripted conversation about what it was like back then and answer a few questions for people viewing at home. Uh, but first, I'll introduce everybody that's sitting here with me. Um, to my right, I have Judd Cawley. Hi, folks. Uh, next to him is Johnny Richardson. Uh, his dad was John Richardson. Uh, to my left, I have Joseph Lewis, my dad. And on the end over there, we have Bill Watsovich. You guys have any questions before we start? Not many. All right, so we'll go over some questions here. Um, so there was a certain sameness to the woods work, yet you could be doing something new every month of the year. Do you think that's one of the reasons why you enjoyed the work in the woods and have many good memories of doing it? Sorry. Well, I'll tell you. <clears throat> Juddy here, he's got a lot more experience in the woods than I ever did. I always had a job, and like I'd done that job, I'd go help my dad. Either spreading that grass, cattails. Cattails is a big thing. A lot of work, right, Jeff? A lot of work. A lot of work to cattails. Uh, a lot of hours. A lot of hours. I'll tell you one story about we were picking uh, elk, elk horn. What, what do you call that, Judd? That moss or uh, it's on top of the water? Shaky bed. Shaky bed. What is it, about this thick? Yeah. And you can walk on it, but it's just like a sponge. It was me, my uncle, Ernie, and Dad. We're out there picking up. Right through all up to my hip, and I got one leg out. One, leg. I said, Dad, I, I fell in. He said, Put your arms out, pull yourself out. I said, Okay, so that's what I did. Continued picking elk's horn. That was the last time I picked elk's horn. I'll put it that way. <laughs> shaky that bed? Shaky bed. Shaky yep. bed. My dad and uh, Gordy Lockwood were cutting buttons one time, and uh, the uh, same deal. Gordy, he was picking. It was over on Burt Bridge. And uh, Gordy, he went down. He went, like you said, up to his waist there. <laughs> yeah. And when he went down, there was a rattlesnake there. And Gordy will tell you this. He uh, he yells up to my dad, hey, Reg, Reg, got a big problem over here. <laughs> he goes, what the hell's your problem? He goes over there, and there's a freaking rattlesnake all <laughs> coming up about five foot from his face. And according to Gordy, Dad had a sickle, and he threw that sickle just to scare it. Yeah. He cut that thing. Did it? Yeah, and pulled Gordy out, and same thing, he left, and they never went back to their land. <laughs> it, was, it was too much for him. Well, I know, when you're licking in the water up to here, you don't know, you, you can't got a snapping turtle, you got snakes, you know, you don't know. Can't move. So you want to get out quick. Yep. You know. It's a scary feeling. It is. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh... So the uh, next question we had here, uh, so many of the plants are listed in the book about common weeds. Uh, do you think they were just weeds? Did they mean anything different to you? To us they were just weeds. I mean it was, it was money, it was yeah. making, uh, putting food on the table and paying your bills. And it was weeds, sometimes having a bloom like status, you know, you, yeah. got, the, you got your purple yeah. bloom. Down the shore, the Jersey status. Yep. Uh, English status got a blue. Right. Different colors, right? But that was a wildflower, though. That, yeah, that's right. It was cultivated. Yep. Yeah. Snakeweed. That had flowers. Yep. Snakeweed had a yeah. yeah. Yellow flower. Yep. One of them. Actually, everything had a has a bloom to it. Yeah. yeah. But as far as the, uh, I mean, so they might classify them as weeds and undesirables. The locations that we went out to uh, were, uh, they call them, the scientists and all those guys, they call them uh, waste areas. So waste areas and thrown away weeds, but uh, to the pineys that were pulling them, 
I mean, they were money, right? They were feed, feeding the family, right? That was our paycheck. Yeah. So, what you call weed is kind of something that was valuable to us. Yep. All right, question three. I've come to understand there was a specific knowledge base that all pines have when it comes to the woods and the plants they harvested. The Richardson calendar contained over 100 plant craft items. I highly value that information today. I know where I learned some of the first-hand information from, my father and my grandparents. Uh, each of us, I'd like everybody to answer this, uh, where do you think you learned uh, the items that you made a living at and what people cl classically would call the pineys that were out there picking pine cones and raking sphagnum moss. Where did you learn that trade from? I'll start to my left on the end, Bill. Where do you think you learned how to do the, the sphagnum moss and the stuff that you did in the woods, Bill? Oh, by talking to other people that done it. Yeah, anybody yeah. personal? Like yeah. yeah, people I know, they were, the old timers at that time. I find out, I found out where their good spots were at and uh, who they were selling them to, who they were selling them off to, and uh, things like that there. I went and got a rake, and tub, and I was in business. <laughs> That's how you did it. Right. What about you, Joe? Uh, my uncle, my father, Jack, John. John Richardson? Yeah, John Richardson. Yeah. They taught me a lot. Judd? Uh, Learn everything from my dad, uh, Reds. Reds Collie. He, yeah, he um, he started when he was real young, real real young, and um, he was real good friends with his father at, at an early age. Uh, sort of the friendship became from uh, coon hunting. His father used to pick up Jack. He used to pick up my dad and um, take him coon hunting when he was ten years old or so. And then uh, as he got older and was able to do the woods work there. He learned off of Jack what to cut, when to cut it, where, you know, everything. And then um, as years went by, my dad, he eventually told me. And uh, it's basically where I got it from. My dad, uh, different spots was just knowledge of the woods and fields. Not everything is cut down to pines. Uh, a lot of the stuff, probably the majority of the stuff, 80% of the stuff that you have on the Richardson calendar there is usually cut in the country, not in the pines. So, probably a lot of people don't know that because you're always writing about the pines. So Sometimes they just ride around and look at fields, you know, before they plow in the spring. Yep. And, uh, so, oh man, it's a nice field of pepper grass there, right, Pepper grass, right, pepper grass yep. Huh? Pepper Every grass, week. the yep. petty grass. Greatest sight you've ever seen, right, John? <laughs> <laughs> That's what it sounds like. That was your dad's thing. Yep. thing. Yeah, yep. You're right. Yep. You're right. He used to love saying that. Johnny, where do you say? Oh, Dad. Dad? Dad. Dad. So, what about uh, Uncle Ernie? The other brothers? Just mainly Dad taught you. I work mostly with Dad. Yep. My Uncle Lack, Dad's brother. Never worked out in the woods with him or anything. He, he used to make the cedar boxes. That's my mommy's there. And Judge and Mom used to make uh, for, for Lack, right? For Lester. Yep. And uh, Ernie is when uh, me, Dad, and Ernie would go. Maybe he bought a patch of yarrow or anything. You know, somebody was growing stuff. We'd go down and down the hammock and cut it down the hammock. Got a story down the hammock to down to uh, Buck Suey. Yep. Had a patch of uh, yarrow. Me and Dad go down. He said, I got to try and buy this yarrow. So we get out. They started talking. Buck says, well, I want this much for the patch. That's, oh no, no. Can't do that. He says, why? Says, well, on account of. That was one of the, on account of. Well, when he said on account of, means it ain't gonna work. We gotta come with another solution here. They're talking, but then they get, they talk, well, do you know this guy? Have you ever done this? Get away from the patch. Don't even talk about the patch. Talk about something else. This went on for about an hour. 
I said, well, I'm, I went down, I sat on the truck, I said, this might be all day, you know. About a half hour goes by, 45 minutes. So they were talking now for maybe two hours. Did I get in the truck, he said, well, we'll come back tomorrow, we'll get that patch of yarrow. I said, okay, and I, we might have had you go on that trip, or punk, because me and punk and dad, I don't know if anybody else is with us or not. Each of us grabbed a row. We started cutting the air. I wasn't too bad, you know, I was no slacker. I look, I'm halfway down the row and I look up and he's almost to the end of his row. With pump. That man can work. Right there. You know, back in the day. <laughs> all, of us, all of us are slow now. But that man can work. So we got the patch and Everybody was happy. So that so that knowledge base, right? So, because uh, I did a ton of research on this, trying to catalog the 101 items of the Richardson calendar. It's so just so you guys validate what I say, right? So knowledge base, because uh, oftentimes the stereotype of pineys is country bumpkins, backwoods person, uh, nothing polite to say about a piney, right? Um, but you could say the same thing, negative stuff about a farmer. They know how to plant corn. That's all they do, right? Plant corn. They do a whole lot of other things to keep that machinery moving. They gotta be mechanics, you know, so on and so on. So what's the piney things that don't make them just country bumpkins backwoods people, right? Uh, so there's 101 items, uh, whether it's uh, sphagnum moss or pine cones. I guess you, you gotta know what the item is. So you gotta know what it looks like in the woods. You gotta know what it looks like in the woods when it's ready to be cut. Right? Uh, if you pull penny crest with a blossom on top, the little white flowers, try to dry it, it, it molds up and looks like crap. Right? So you gotta know when to cut it. Uh, then when, when, not where to sell it, but how to sell it. So does it go and buy the pound? Does it go by, you know, how many uh, pine cones goes in a bag? Um, and then you need to know who you're gonna sell it to. Um, if you're making pennies when you're out there on the plains, spending the whole entire day, eight to 10 hours a day, on the plains pulling pine cones, you don't want to sell them to the lowest bidder because they're almost worth nothing to begin with, right? You want to make sure you look around and figure out who's going to, who's buying the most, who's paying the most this, this time of day, uh, this time of year to get rid of them. Um, so you got that. And, and then the other thing is getting out to where they're at. Uh, get out on the plains and what roads you're using, what's the location, what's your honey pot, what's your gold mine of a site that you want to go to that can sustain you for eight hours and fill up a truckload of it. Uh, that's that's uh, like reconnaissance. It's like uh, information that you don't share with anybody else because you don't want them out there pulling that field of peppergrass or pennycrest because that's where you're going to make your money at. Did I miss anything as far as the knowledge base of that? Or you said when it was knowing when to pick it, you know, timing too early. early. Yeah, yeah, and late too. If you yeah. pick it too late, you're gonna have right. an item that's gonna shatter. It's gonna be no good. And you do all that work and you bring it into say Jack or whoever is buying at the time, you just wasted a whole day's pay or work for nothing because they're not gonna Wait take it. Wait too long and it fuzzes out on you sometimes yeah. with some of this stuff. Yep. Yeah. And that's because, and then that's who's your, who are you selling it to? Needs to know to reject it because yeah. We say like buttons. There's a picture of buttons over on the table, the little white flowers in the middle. Uh, there's a false buttons, false right? Button. Somebody said, who told me the story that they cut a whole load of them? If what? you take your finger on top of it, it'll just shatter all apart. They're no good, no good for the market. Which is a different type of a plant, and the pineys know that. So they're not out there wasting their time cutting an item that's not the real button, um, which is the terms that the pineys call these plants there's a different term that the scientists use but uh so you need also know that there's one that looks like the other one but you got the knowledge to know that this is the right one that one over there it comes in too early and we know we're not cutting buttons at that time so there, there's, there's more, more experience right there i guess the younger pineys might cut a load and i heard a funny story of a, a piney cutting a load of false buttons and taking it in to john richardson or maybe to reds and uh they're like you cut the wrong stuff that's that's not the right one and that's because it wouldn't hold up 
in the dry floor industry, which is where all these piney craft items went to. They went into this industry to, uh, the money was in that industry and people decorated their windows and their, their, their houses with bouquets and stuff like that and their businesses with the big windowscapes, New York City and, and Wall Street, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, John Richardson, a lot of his went to Philadelphia, right? The big city in Philadelphia. Yeah. When he cut the uh, birch twigs or whips, whatever you want to call them, uh, you're the ones that suckers like, right? Mm -hmm. Come out of the ground. Pretty, right? much, yeah. Pretty much the suckers, right? And you, well, a lot of some of the guys, you'd have to watch, they cut the limbs off the birch trees. It's not the same. And it's not the same, is it? No, no. no. So you have to look through them, pull them out, you just pull them out. You know? So you can't do this, this is no good. Right, but uh, it's different. You gotta know what you're buying. Right. All right. So, next question, guys. Um, so, I guess uh, probably a different feeling and answer for if you were a buyer or if you were actually the guy still in the selling. Uh, and some people on this panel here uh, have done both. They were buyers and sellers. But uh, kind of want to get everybody's opinion on this too. Is uh, so. At the end of the day, you know, how did you feel when you went out all day and came home with a pocket full of money, a pocket full of cash? Uh, you spent your all day out, say, in the bogs, Bill. How'd that make you feel when you came home and you had, you know... <laughs> it made you feel pretty good. So you guys agree with that? Gee, no uh, argument there. When I was about 22, I was in... I was learning how to shoe horses. I was in Brandywine, Delaware, living down there at the track. Five days a week, I was making sixteen dollars a day. Guy was teaching me, so he, he was doing me a favor by teaching me. So it wasn't paying me a lot, you know, because I didn't know nothing to begin with. That sixteen dollars, you had to buy lunch, breakfast, dinner. Stayed at the track in the dormitory, so that didn't cost me anything. Well, there wasn't a lot of money left at the end of the week. But I come home on the weekends and I work for dad and he gave me forty dollars a day. Or if we go out, cut, whatever, you know, if we had something going on, I'd go out and cut with him. I'd be a little more. Not too much more. Right. But a little more. But anyway, working on the weekends put me over the hump. I had enough money for gas, get back down to Delaware and go back to work with that guy learn how to shoe horses the one thing you, when you're talking about that Johnny uh, kind of spurred my a thought in my head about kind of missed it the, that knowledge bridge right was uh, you know knowing where to go knowing what to cut um, uh, but also it was a full-time thing right it was a uh, like coming up I, I, I wrote recently about April April's when the Richardson calendar starts because that's when the Pentecrest comes in. That's like the first item to start the season. And then you know, I mean, Judd can rattle off in his head, what's the next item I should be looking for? So when you're out there, uh, wherever you're at, you know, traveling and stuff like that, you're looking for that next item, next field of it coming up. It looks like it's coming up over there. That might be a good spot later on. So you're always on the clock. You're always working looking for that next item that's coming in that'll be potentially something to make money for you to make, get you over the hump or right. fill the family budget or whatever. Always that's to, knowledge. Always pray to a farmer, don't plow the field before yeah. you get to yeah. it. Right. The, the first thing was fluffy grass, really. Fluffy uh, grass? That came before Pentecrest. And um, that usually grows alongside the road most of the time, 99% of the time. And like you said, that was a nice cotton, little item, wasn't it? That was a nice little item. I liked it. Yeah. It was always sick. You always make yeah, a little the wrong bit. side of the road. Ernie used to say, you, first... you pull off the side of the road, you run over 100 pounds of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was the first item to come in after picking yeah. pine cones, not making no money. Yeah. But uh, once you was cutting fluffy grass, you always had your eyes out in that field right out there. Damn, that looks like pennycrest is going to be coming up in that field. Kind of a fragile grass, yeah. wasn't it? Uh, oh yeah. Y you know what I mean? Yep. They're kind of like laid and <laughs> laid right over. Laid right over, right? Yeah. Yep. But it was, you know. It was a good item. You can make a hundred hours a day. Yeah. Yeah. But again, 
but you always had your eye out looking for the next thing. And same thing with what pennycress. When the pennycress was over, uh, maybe you know the next item was uh, peppergrass. Peppergrass. So yeah, yeah. you know, even before the plant even starts to form a, a stalk onto it, you know, that grass, the everything was there. You knew, you had an eye for it. You knew what he was doing. And the the scientists, the botanists uh, back in the day, they paid local pineys to take them out to see certain plants, right? I mean, in the pineys in this business, in the dry floor industry, I mean, you knew what a plant looked at at different stages of its life. So you knew what it looked like when it was coming up two inches tall to when it's getting full heads and you know the blossom's coming and then the money's coming after that blossom drops off it, right? Pennycrest or peppergrass like that or fluffy grass and stuff like that. But that's, you know, a plant in different stages. I mean, that's almost like your little amateur scientists. I won't go that far, but that's that's knowledge you know yeah and it's not a they sure don't expect that from a country pumpkin no right no all right next question uh so talking about back in the heyday uh when you were able to walk into the woods and this is something bill spurred a question from me back in the heyday when you were able to walk in the woods and cut whatever you wanted did you ever think that that would change did you think that what you were doing uh, before would become outlawed? And uh, before you answer, I'm going to look to Bill to answer that question. So, real quick, uh, got a t-shirt up uh, in the back of my shirt. Piney outlaw. Yeah, you're an outlaw piney. If you... What you are the items on there, uh, you Judge? You know you're an outlaw piney if you cut birch whips, elk's horn, cattails, buttons. Or if you pulled peppergrass, pine cones, grapevine, and foxtails. Some so, of the items. So back to so with the question. I don't know if you saw Bill that, but the question is, I'll give it to you, Bill. First, is uh, do you ever think that what you were doing for dozens and dozens of years out in the woods would become something that would actually make you against the law? Yes, it did. Uh, yes, I yes I did. I knew what was going to happen. Yeah, and uh, did you ever ever have a run-in with the law? Oh, plenty of times. <laughs> <laughs> I had him seize my load, seize the truck too. You know all about that. So I, I could, what were you I cutting at the time for that? <laughs> uh, I was cutting sweet huck one time. I was cutting pine or picking pine cones one time, and cutting hog brush one time. And. and uh, I mean, would it be so people don't know? I mean, would, state police, no, uh, no, state forest ranger, yeah. a ranger, right? Yeah. So, so it became something. And what did he do? Point out to you that it's against this rule? No. no. Oh, he wrote his ticket out removing <laughs> vegetation from state property. Uh huh. State. So, state. Sometimes they would write it out like operating a commercial enterprise, all state property. I don't know how many times I was sitting in a courtroom. <laughs> they get you no insurance, then you're in trouble. It happens to others besides me. You get your license suspended for six months, five hundred dollar fine. You get towed in. Then you got to go through uh, getting your truck back and uh, get your lawyer, and uh, then you're out of business for a while. And if you're out of business for a while, you're out of money for a while, right? I guess you are. <laughs> in trouble. Dad, uh, Joe? Pat, Pat got caught. They took his truck. Your brother? Yeah, my brother. Weymouth, cutting whips. <laughs> cutting birch whips in, in Weymouth, New they Jersey? They took the truck and everything. Yeah. Huh. yeah, to go to court. I don't know what he got out of it, but so it I cost mean, him a lot more money than he made. Than he made, <laughs> yeah. But, so the, but the risk was sometimes worth the reward, right? Yeah. That's the only way you knew how to make money. You kind of were up against a rock in a hard place, as they say. It wasn't hurting nothing, but they didn't look at it that way. It's going to grow back. It'd grow right back. Grow right back. That's what you thought too, Bill? Was it hurting anybody, you cutting that brush out there that the no. fire burns down? No, because the state burns the land off every year in, in lots of places. Yeah. The so hog brush makes up the biggest part of the underbrush. Yep. Same yep. way with the sweet hook. So when you removed it, it's almost like you were doing the forest fire guys a, a service yeah what do you guys think judd 
Uh, I got in trouble cutting sea lavender one time. So, uh, late 80s, um, <coughs> we was cutting sea lavender. I was cutting sea lavender for a guy in Quakertown, Pennsylvania. <laughs> he uh, paid more than anybody else on the sea lavender. And where we cut that down, Tucker, it grows out on the meadows, on the salt meadows. And uh, we cut every spot we had cut before we, it was we cleaned it out. So a friend of mine, uh, Rube Wells, he, uh, he told me about a spot down in Avalon. He said, it's thick. Just take a truck down there, you'll be home by 12 o'clock. Is it thick as hair on a dog? <laughs> Thicker. <laughs> Thicker. <laughs> That's an old phrase behind such yeah. right? <laughs> but uh, I went down there one day, took a ride down there, I found it, and it was thick. And I was cutting. At the time I had a El Camino, 79 El Camino and I put side racks onto it and got there probably worked about three hours and I had probably three quarters of a load of status it was so thick you could just grab grab a handful and it was tall too like this you could just grab it squeeze it and break it you didn't need no suck or nothing just rubber band it throw it in your pile so I'm getting ready to get out of there and there's a bridge that come over one of the creeks there where I was working at and the uh, <coughs> truck pulled up behind me, flashing the lights. It was a city truck, township truck or whatever. And a guy gets out, he had a suit on, and a regular worker, he gets out, and they come up to me, and the guy in the suit asked me, he says, uh, can I ask you what you're doing in there? So I'm just looking to see if I'm going to be able to cut some of this sea lavender. No, you can't cut it out here. I said, all right, I, said, I figured I'd ask anyway, you know. And they knew that I had cut, and they they called me on it, and I tried to lie my way out of it. Say, oh yeah, I cut this over there in Parker Town, because we've been watching you here, son, for about three hours here. <laughs> and uh, he told me, he says, you know what? You guys get your stuff and you get out, and let's not see you here no more. And come to find out, he was the mayor of Avalon. Did he let you take your load with you? Yeah, take the load and get out. But get out and don't come back. Get out, don't come back. That piney outlaw forever. Uh, prime yeah. example, huh? He could have took everything, like he said. He could have took my truck or whatever, but uh, I don't know. Got away with it. One for the pineys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> what about you, Johnny? Anything? No, I never had a uh, run in with the law. With the, I know you couldn't cut on the state property and all that, you know. But, well, but year, that, years ago you could, because them cat. Cat poles, me and your dad and Ernie cut them at Double Trouble Park down there in Porker River. They let, used to let you go out there if you asked permission, but now you can't even. So the laws change. Can't cut a weed now. You know? Double Trouble. Yeah. I pulled in there with dad to get cat paws. He goes, boy, I guess it was a ranger or a fire ward or something. You know, right? it's office there. Yep. He walked in. There. Yeah. No, he said, guy said you can't cut them. You can't. I don't know if it was growing in cranberry bog or what the yeah, hell it was. Right there next to the building there used to be big cranberry bogs there. That was, that's the place, Monk. Yeah, that's, that's the place. That's me, Ernie, and your dad cut there. Well, well I, when I went down there with Dad, the guy said, absolutely not, because you're going to ruin it. Well, this was another... I, I went back in the truck because they were... <laughs> about an hour later, Dad come and said, yeah, see, we got them cat paws. <laughs> so, yeah. I tell you what, he wouldn't give up, you know. Yeah. He wouldn't give up. We cut in there because he needed the money like everybody else. Yeah. But that, that's the place. Yeah. It was right next to the building, Paul. Yep. Yeah. And this was loaded with cat poles. There's some nice, nice ones in there. We cut a lot out of there. Yep. That day. I mean, Bill, the, with the sphagnum moss, right? I mean, that that was like one of the oldest items that was being being taken out of the pine barrens. And uh, so for a long time, I mean, almost anybody and everybody was out there getting sphagnum moss, right? So. Yeah. It was legal, or it wasn't regulated, right? And it's unchanged. Yeah, some landowners didn't want people on their property getting it. But generally, you could you can pull moss wherever you find it out pretty near. So, you weren't always an outlaw. You were doing things that you learned from somebody else who, they didn't say it, was out, it wasn't against the law then, but as you were doing it and as you were getting older, Eventually, that tradition became uh, against the law. 
that way of making income it went yeah it came they started them. enforcing the laws more stricter as time went by and probably when they put that big fence up around the pine barrens and they said this is now at the national pine barrens reserve because yeah. then they started enforcing laws that they put on the books saying that you can't take vegetation from these parks even though they weren't parks before when you were going there before and the guy before you was going there they became now protected and no longer able to do it. Interesting. Um, so next question, uh, a couple more here. So do you think people would want to cut and pull some of the Pinecraft items of old, like we were talking about, sphagnum moss, peppergrass, uh, cat's paws, buttons, elk's horn. Do you think people today would want to do that if they were legally allowed? What do you think, Johnny? Think what? If, if, if they were legally allowed to go out and cut cat's paws today or a hog hook out in the woods here, do you think people would do it? Most people wouldn't. Why? No. It just work. <laughs> it's hard work? It's work. People don't want to work. Finding places is the hard thing now. Yeah. yeah. So if the state, some miracle said, all right, there's a certain uh, population of people that are pineys, not sure how we would classify that and check off the boxes. You live this far out in the woods, check. You've been around here for a hundred years, check. You know what a cat's paw is, check. Then they would issue some kind of blanket license or something like that. Bill, do you think they would, uh, anybody, the young guys today would actually want to go out there? I don't think many of them would want to do it anymore. Like it? So Judd and I are the youngest on this tiny panel here. I mean, we uh, we know where to make money somewhere else, right? A little bit of easier? I would say a lot easier. Yeah. I work in an office, so I know it's not even close to being a piney out in the woods. Right. <laughs> Getting back to your thing here, um, if the dried floral industry didn't die, and there were still good spots to cut, uh, I believe some of the younger guys would do it, because it's when the dried flower industry died, there was a lot of young guys into it. A lot, a lot of city guys, well, I call city folks there. They was, you know, they was doing it part time, and they was making more money on the weekends than they was all week working at their foundry or wherever they was working. So, if the industry was still alive and kicking, there would be, they would be doing it. But nowadays, the way it is, wasting your time. Yeah. So, uh, next question. Uh, what's one or two things? that make you a piney outside of working in the woods? Anybody can answer this. It's a, what do you think, I mean, I never knew the word growing up, so nobody ever called me a piney. I didn't know what that was until I started researching the book, 2018. The, Bill, you're the oldest here. Yeah. Uh, you've probably been called the piney the longest and the most uh, by anybody out there that writes for the newspapers no, or anything. I, I never looked on myself as being a piney. No? In my opinion, a piney is, is, is sort of like a birthright. You got to have a, you got to be a descendant of somebody that worked around these pines in the past. Maybe around cranberry bogs, even when they had these paper mills, glass factories, and cutting, making charcoal and jobs like that. They didn't intermingle with with the surrounding uh, suburban types. They just kept it themselves. Right. Anything that you would think, uh, Joe, that would uh, make you a piney, besides uh, cutting? My grandfather was always did cranberries and stuff. Joe Britton. That's what he did. So the old industries? Yeah, we, whatever you can find. You know, make money. Answer for that, Judd? Besides well, being like, in the woods? Well, according to the way Bill looks at it, <coughs> my father, it's, uh, it's all he's ever done since he was able to go out there and work. He, he made his living out of the, off the fields, the woods, the whole nine yards, so I'm a descendant, so. Yeah. I'm a and piney I done the same and dame thing, only, so. right, Joe? What's that? So I'm a piney and dame only, really. Yep. Because I, I grew up around it. Grew up around it. Knew the Lived people it. that came in to sell stuff. Yep. Jim, uh, Jimmy calls me the last piney because I'm the youngest out of all of Well, them. he's probably right. <laughs> <laughs> My mother was, uh, she come from Newark, so she 
and she was not a piney, some 50 percenter. <laughs> you know, my part dad time, was part time piney. Part time piney, there you go. I had a boat shoot on my truck called Part Time Piney. Yeah, but that was, he was 100 percent piney, you know. Yep. That made it. Made that a little better than a lot of pineys. I'll put it that way. Yeah, the, uh, so I mean, and I agree with everything that everybody said because uh, I wanted to hear your opinion of what a piney was. Because uh, I kind of came up with, I mean, just me, real quick. Bill Lewis. I pulled pine cones with my dad on the plains uh, and cut birch. Uh, pulled peppergrass, pennygrass, and stuff like that. Worked for John Richardson. Uh, did a lot of that stuff for a number of years. Walked away from it when I graduated from high school. Um, joined the Marine Corps. Uh, never looked back on what it was or what it is to be a Piney. Uh, graduated college, you know, work a good paying job in a suit and stuff like that. So uh, if you guys, I mean, I wouldn't be any type of Piney if, if, if the only things that you guys said was a Piney today. I wouldn't be a piney at all then. I guess I wouldn't be able to claim that that as part of my heritage because I've been so far removed from it because, and not due to my own free will, you know, you stop becoming that old time piney who only lived in the woods and his house was out on the bogs because America moved on. America went from, you know, that agriculture-based society to you know, we're all knowledge workers now. I'm an office guy. I work on a computer and stuff like that. Uh, so if you guys, I would, my, my connection to being a piney is severed and I'm no longer a piney and the piney dies with you guys. I, I kind of, after writing this book for the last two years, come to the opinion that the word piney has evolved to you guys are woods pineys, the reluctant pineys, you know, rel reluctant to leave the woods uh, reluctant to get a 40-hour workweek job. You guys are the epitome of that. And where does that leave me, Bill Lewis, who's, you know, third generation uh, working in the woods and stuff like that, but have been so far removed from that. Uh, I got to ask Judd sometimes, is this Heather? Is it, you know, is it this plant? Because I forget. And that's the reason why I'm writing the second book. Oh, you're a part-time piney. Part-time piney. But I think today... You know, there's a lot of people that love the Pine Barrens um, and are living in the Pine Barrens or visit the Pine Barrens uh, that the, if they adopt the, the culture and they respect the history of the area, um, you guys, the cranberry boggers, the blueberry bog, uh, uh, farmers and stuff like that, uh, they're welcome to that word too. Because um, otherwise, I wouldn't be welcome to it. By your guys' definition, I wouldn't be a piney because I'm too educated and I'm too removed from the woods because of the work that I do today to support my family. And I don't want to lose that connection. So I think the term's kind of been broadened to include all those people, even tree huggers who take their camera out in the bogs and they take pictures of these plants that we know by cat's paw and they don't know what a cat's paw is, that fluffy plant on the the right there that's a cat's ball to us um, because I learned that term too but to them when they're taking their photos them tree hugger pineys that's uh, Tony cotton grass and it has a Latin name too but the more common name is Tony cotton grass not what we call it what Johnny's dad sold it as cat's paws that means nothing to anybody today so it feels it's just like a cat's paw right right that's where they get it from it's awful soft. Yeah. yeah. Just like a cat's paw. So I, if we if we leave and stay in the uh, past, that piney would no longer, or you wouldn't be able to use that word today. And I'd like to think, uh, to include myself in using that term, that the other people, even that tree hugger piney, they can use the term, they're a different type of piney, um, just like there's different types of Americans. Uh, truly, the word to make it survive. Um, and uh, your guys' history to be told and retold, uh, we need to expand its definition. And uh, I, if you agree or disagree, we all got opinions and stuff like that, but that's kind of where I'm coming from on it. Because again, you guys want to be able to say, I'm a piney at all. I, I would think that would be a, a 
that would hurt. Because <laughs> it is something to be proud of yeah, to say. I've been down on the plains pulling pine cones, you're a piney. <laughs> All right, last question, a silly question. Bill likes silly questions. Man of sense, of sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. Right, Bill? You like laughing, right? Yeah. I, I got a silly question here. Uh, somewhat silly. Last question, uh, wrap this up. Uh, so what is the weirdest or scariest thing you encountered in the pines? I'll start with you, Bill. That's a, it's a hard question? Yeah, that's a hard question. So the strangest or scariest thing happened to you out in the pines, and you were always out in the pines by yourself, right? So, yeah. the Jersey Devil, or you're <laughs> only a fool bring something like that, <laughs> right? <laughs> Somebody that agrees with me. Not everybody agrees with you, though, Bill. A lot of people think the Jersey Devil is—he's the man. He's yeah. still around. A lot of people have made more money off of him <laughs> looking for him than cattails. You ever get? <laughs> yeah, cutting cattails or something. I only had one strange occurrence. It wasn't in the pines. It was sitting in Fred Brown's house down Hogwall. Uh huh. He had this thermometer on the wall. He had the kerosene lamp on in his house. He was laying in his in his chair. He was drinking and all. He just kind of dozing off. Like I happened to look at the thermometer and I seen a face appear in the thermometer. It was, a, it was a, a sea captain, like I had one of them turn of the century hats on. I thought it was a picture in the thermometer. First, I walked over and looked at it, there was nothing there. When he woke up, I asked him about it, he said it belonged to a sea captain. The thermometer did? Yeah. Huh. huh. You seen a picture, but there wasn't any there, the right? only thing something like that ever happened. At least to me. What about you, Joe? I don't know. I know you recanted one and you might not remember. What about your Jersey Devil inspired uh, thing that you did in the backwoods in New Egypt and you scared a guy? Make it, oh, made that him was there was a guy we knew he was coming from one house to another through the woods and it was real dark and everything so my cousin and his uh, brother-in-law we just killed the hog and they took the hog head out there. They scared that poor guy, that young kid almost to death. He was our, their best friend too, but um, they, they called the, he called the cops and everything. They was out there in the woods looking for him. For the, the Jersey the, Devil? Yeah, the Plumstead Police was out there looking. <laughs> Down the back road. That was a hog head. So, oh man, he was, when he came to the house, because he was coming to our house. When he got there, I thought he was gonna die. <laughs> That's on Jersey Devil I was saying. <laughs> and you induced that story. <laughs> How about you, Judd? Uh, I guess uh, me and Dad, we was on the plains. I'm going back late 80s. We're uh, pine bowling up there. And uh, we come across the grave, grave site. And um, homemade stone onto it. It out of wood. And it had... Uh, I forget the dates, but the date would have been like six years apart, like say, say 2000, and it'd been 2006. Right. Just for an example. Young. And the uh, the grave site was probably about four foot in length, and really well taken care of. And I don't think that was. And on the stone it said little one. And there was no, no like dog collar, like if somebody would have buried a dog there or something, there would have been a dog collar there or something. It was just too, it was just too weird. Just one grave? Just one grave all by itself. And I showed Dad, Dad was like, go down the road a little bit. So it kind of spooky. Gave it respect. <laughs> Gave it, yeah, a little respect. <laughs> yeah, a, little bit, a, little, a little bit spooky too, yeah. 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 And um, I can take you right to that spot. And, but it was just, just the grave site alone wouldn't fit unless it was like a big ass dog or something. But it sounds like it was it a young, like it might have little been a person. I didn't have the finances or whatever to to do what they wanted to do proper. But uh, nobody's never going to bother it down there, right? No, nope. <laughs> but that was right out, right on the plains, but coming more or less off of um, coming out of us. Like if he was coming out from Oswego and Sim Place, coming that. Well, that direction was all the way up, pretty much on that hill. Like if you look on the plains, it goes kind of up on the hill to where mm -hmm. it's back up. It's up in that general area. Huh. That was kind of 
Kind of eerie. What about you, Johnny? Worst thing happened to me, I already told you, I fell through that soggy bottom. <laughs> and, had my, and my leg. <laughs> Couldn't if wait we to... had a picture of that, that would be worth some good money. <laughs> Couldn't wait to get out. Yeah. Locally in the Pine Barrens region and surrounding countryside, were 101 plants harvested year-round as part of the Richardson calendar. Named so for one of the titans of the dried floral industry, John Richardson. You can hear his son sing the names of plants that only Pawnees used for generations. That knowledge is dying out. The words are carried on the winds of yesterday, for most folks don't recall the Piney of yesterday, the lost Piney culture of New Jersey. And the voices of Johnny, Judd, Joe, and Bill Wasovich, one can hear the hardness and pride of working in the woods, day in and day out. The Jersey Devil may be the most famous Piney of today, but these men and a few others remember the old days, where time stood still and man's progress and his societal standard of a normal 40-hour work week weren't no more welcome in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey than the winged and hoofed Jersey Devil of Piney lore. In the 21st century, thousands of men and women in South Jersey are proud to claim the title Piney. Bill Wasowitz and the others were one type of Piney that is fast fading to just a memory. The term Piney has broadened and today there are many different types of Pineys in existence. The same can be said for the various types of Americans today. Hidden in plain sight, where days of old mix with days of tomorrow, give a listen to Gina and Ken reading an excerpt from the book New Jersey's Lost Piney Culture. I'm Gina. My name's Ken. And we're here because of um, the book that brought us together, helped us understand our differences. And um, this book, New Jersey's Lost Piney Culture by William J. Lewis, talks about the different types of pineys that there are in our area here. Um, one of the first times that I met Ken, he was fishing and he was all dressed in camo and I thought to myself, why is he in a uniform and fishing looking like he needs to be hunting? And uh, so I asked him and from that day on, we've been together for 15 years and um, we are very different people. Um, in the, in the story where we looked at different types of, of pineys and I most identify with the tree-hugging piney, the, the kind of person who is a transient. I came from Long Island originally and I never went back. And Ken grew up in Turnersville? Turnersville, South Jersey. Always been in South Jersey. And uh, now lives in Chatsworth. So he's, he's part of the hunting fishing culture. And uh, I came to school here in uh, 1977, and I've been here ever since. And 15 years ago, we met, and we're still together today. The Hunter Piney, many a shotgun tuning young man, came to the Jersey Pines to hunt game animals like ducks, deer, foxes, and bobwhite quail. They established hunting clubs and had hunting cabins in their territories and came down and stayed during the hunting season. The love of the land eventually gets a strong hold on many of these outsiders and turns them into insiders and year-round residents. Not to be confused with a woods piney, many of these hunters adopted their work to support their love of hunting, with some even becoming pine cone pickers. Note author John Stinton in the book Pinelands Folk Life first described in general terms someone who decided to stay in the pines. Those who could live within the seasonal rhythms of the place. The Tree Hugger Piney. Someone who takes a photo of Lake, Lake Apsigami and captures the pristine landscape and never wants to see it altered, just like a snapshot in time. Today, we call them environmentalists and conservationists. Many flock to the area and continue to do so, seeking glimpses of the unique flora and fauna. Possibly without their help, we wouldn't have the pines we have today. The Company Piney, a leftover family in the Jersey Pines that worked for generations from one bus industry to another, 
Later, the local workforce was stabilized by forming both the owner of small and large farms and their loyal employees who worked the land are included here. Prime examples are the Ocean Spray folks that who lived and died as company men. We're sure they did well for themselves and mean no negative connotations. Like the highly adaptive pine tree that makes up the pine barrens that suffers fire and is reborn and survives to regrow, the company Piney has learned to do the same. The Educated Piney Those natives who were well off enough and had the smarts it took to go off to college. Sometimes they came back and stayed in the Jersey Pines. And lots of times they just visited. The Conway Twitty Piney Conway Twitty was Granny Lewis's favorite guitar player. At White's Bog Blueberry Festivals, she always liked the country and bluegrass bands, and as far as she was concerned, any person who could strum an instrument or carry a tune who lived in the Jersey Pines was a Twitty Piney. The Out of Town Piney with Boat Slip. Lots of folks who are rich enough to have a second home located in the Jersey Pines tend to have money for a boat as well. Whether you like it or not, we all came to the area at one time or another. The closeness to Philly and New York has had a major influence in shaping the area. A few of us are proud to wear the title of Piney, just like the rest of us, and the rest of us welcome them to do it. The Firefighter Piney. Fire and the pines go together like peanut butter and jelly, and the same could be said about the South Jersey Firefighter. Whether fighting for wildfires year-round, protecting their neighbors, or fighting fire in their own backyards, their sense of service to the region is admirable. This was not always a full-time paying job, but it is a full-time work when a fire catches. The volunteer firemen and the fire stations supporting them become 24-hour fixtures of the piney landscape. The Patriotic Piney The New Jersey Pines has a large chunk of it contained behind big governmental fences, where thousands of men and women are trained to be in the armed forces. A lot of those folks who came to the area from around the United States retired in New Jersey, happy and content to live in their adopted state, finding solace in the open space and the many opportunities to fish, trap, and hunt in the pines. This type was never really described by Granny Lewis, so the author here is injecting his interpretation to describe Granny herself. Poor enough to afford a tub of lard and a loaf of white bread, this piney would make hard sandwiches for lunch. The woods piney depended on the woods to provide the family with a wage to live by. Whether the men ran beat up pickup trucks to the woods, looking for scrap junk cars, or, or hauling a load of pine cones from the plains, you betcha they didn't care what you called them. With fried snapper meat from snapping turtles caught fresh, out of the flowering creeks, or deer shot year-round to keep the fridge full, the piney did what he could to get by. There are many reasons for the word reluctant to be used to describe these pineys. As the times were changing and full-time employment took them out of the woods, they were reluctant to go, but progress crawled up to them. They were reluctant to leave the generations of woods work, but now they had to adapt or become extinct. There are pineys still out there, living alongside native New Jerseyans. Usually, you can't recognize them, for they've been stirred into the big homogenous melting pot of today. If you get lucky, you'll catch a glimpse of a bumper sticker on a car driving down a highway that reads, Proud to be a piney, from my nose down to my hiney, or maybe Piney Tribe, with the WASP logo that has a pine cone for a stinger, which is evidence that there's resistance to the winds of change that took the piney out of the fields and woods of southern New Jersey. Piney Tribe alludes to a larger living and thriving community holding the old ways and culture near to their heart. Newspapers for years have said Bill Wasowitz was the last piney, but they were wrong. There are thousands of us still here, unlike the spring and fall winds that take our migratory birds from our backyards to faraway places, our love of the land keeps the piney's feet in the sand. 
miles of sugar sands that fill up your shoes and get between your toes deep down in your socks any day of the year after a walk in the pines. Here are a few of those voices who today proudly proclaim to be pioneers, and every day more voices are being added to the collective voice of the 21st century piney. Your voice might be one of them. I mean, for a man his age, he's 75 now. I mean, he basically lived off the land all his life. But you're not doing that now. And, you know, we talk about it when we're all together and stuff like that. It's just, to me, it's, you have those memories, but they're lost. Right. Because you can't, you can't do it no more. And it's, I mean, like, I do crafts a lot and stuff, and to go in the store to buy the stuff that I know I could probably go right out in my backyard and get it, it's just, it's not the same. I mean, you can tell the difference, because I do a lot of crafts and stuff. You go in a craft store, you buy a great brine reef, you come home. And you get, you go out and you get it and you make it yourself, you can tell the difference. It's a beautiful place here. I mean, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of roots here. And that's something that I did with my dad all my life. And I lost my dad in a tragic accident. And some days are better than others. It's been 16 years. And when I need my dad the most, I just get in my truck and I take a ride on an old dirt road because I'm sure we've been down it plenty of times. If you're from here, you understand it. If you're not, some people, maybe a handful, oh, you're not trying to blah, 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 blah. But when you've grown up here and you've done it all your life, it's not weird to you. Because we've got people right now, it's natural. We have coyotes here. And they're getting to be pretty bad. But, I mean, it's part of nature and you got a lot of people complaining. Oh, they're outside my window or they're in my yard or, you know, what are you going to do? They're a part of nature. There's, (laughs) it's a part of living here. Same with deer. This is what this place is about. You're in the middle of nowhere. But it's just, we've been here, like I said, I just turned 50 years old. I lived here all my life. I moved away for eight years. And I had an opportunity to go somewhere else or come home. And me and my husband, this is home. There, and I'm glad we made the decision to come back because there's no place like home. I mean, I don't like to have a negative opinion, but it's people like that that have basically ruined it for people like myself. Because it's like they just they got the stereotype that, oh, you have a big truck or whatever. You're just out to tear up and that's it. Like weren't that's I've had we've had that with some people that we've met up you know you've had little bits of arguments and things and it's like not everyone is here to destroy stuff yes it happens but you can't say that I'm the one doing it when you didn't see me doing it right and it's it's just that's part of how I feel it's just a disagreement between different people. But you're a big part of the reason why, you know, there's the stereotyping don't. It's just just because we have big trucks, motorcycles, and ATVs, we're not out to destroy stuff. Not all of us. It, I mean, I know there's people that do do it. I mean, it happens. And to me, that's just pure ignorance. And, and there's a lot of memories on them roads. Oh, no. No, some, no, we don't actually stop barbecue, but we will take roads that'll take us to, say, a restaurant or you happen to be near a local bar or somewhere uh, like that. That's it. Uh, Lucille's, you can ride from my home to Lucille's restaurant on, I think it's 539 or Route 9. You can go from my home all the way there. You go down the tar road 
once, you can get there all through the woods. And, and it's a nice morning ride. And the, the biggest memory we have here is, especially with my dad growing up, even with my kids, when we get um, a snowstorm, it, it's unimaginable the, the things that you see and the pictures that we have to where you're the first one down the road after it's been after it has snowed. And that's something that I always done with my dad after the first snowstorm in the winter. There's roads that you can take to get to Mayo's. There's roads that you can take to get to Billy Boys on 72. And there's probably work to other places that I haven't even experienced yet myself. <laughs> and even there, there was ways that you could take two to even get to the Hedger House here in town when it was open. So question 10, do you consider yourself a piney? Yes, I do. I, I mean, I grew up here. I've seen a lot of things. I've done a lot of things. Like with Hazy, I mean, I may not have worked as hard as he did, and did it as many years as he he did, but I did it. And back then, I only had one child, and being able to go out and work like that helped me take care of my child. And I mean, just from living here all my life, and you see what goes on, like how it was back then, to see how it is today, like you have some that will come here and they say that they are well you've been here maybe a year or two and your view is totally different than mine i'm a, not a nature not but i have a lot of uh, attachment to a lot of places here i mean it's a beautiful place to live and there's you know i have a lot of memories here with family and friends and if this is a special place to me, like I said, this is this is my home. But I had, you know, I had grown up on the western edge of the Pine Barrens, um, and I had a for a father uh, a pretty good woodsman uh, who introduced me at a, a young age. And I grew up um, just down the road from the uh, Black Run Preserve over there in Marlton. Um, so um, even though I was very familiar with the, the Pine Barrens, you know, I played in, it was my backyard. You know, he, he taught me a lot, of, a lot of things. It really was um, 1995 about where I just like, you know, became a complete fanatic about it and, you know, just really studying it and exploring it um, deeply. Is your... But uh, yeah, I mean, like uh, with the woods, though, um, you know, what his favorite thing to do in his spare time um, was going in the woods, and that's how it is with me. You know, when I have uh, any bit of spare time, you know, I don't want to go to the movies, I don't want to go to the bar, I just go to the woods, yeah. <laughs> he probably does say go to the woods, I think. But, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I lost my dad in 1996 when I was, like, uh, 23 years old. You know, the woods could be my backyard, um, you know, here in Leeds Point, which is within the um, Pinelands uh, National Reserve. Right. But but not the, uh, you know, the state protection area. So when you and I connected with the Jersey Devil, so that's cool, too. Right? <laughs> if my, my friends aren't ready to join me, I, I don't hesitate to just go out on my own. Um, and I use it as I mean, like I, like I had might have alluded to before, it's like uh it's like church to me. It is church to me. So um, when you're when you're alone, you know, and, and my style of exploring is not, you know, hiking from point A to point B, you know, pushing it like that. It's 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 more it's slow and it's all, it's almost always off trail. It's through the swamps and it's um, you know very meditative um, and spiritual experience from you know for myself. If I had something to give back, I think it is uh, education, you know. Um, it's like, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not much of an activist type person, you know, I'm not going to be out there really uh, you know, protesting and, or whatever, protect the pines kind of stuff. But uh, I think that, um, um, you know, through education, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of hearts could be turned, 
you know, to the Pines. Um, you know, it was, uh, you know, by, by being able to, um, and that's what I do with the social media a lot, um, even though I've kind of backed away from Facebook somewhat. Uh, I was using it for a, a number of years um, to, you know, just... You know, by, by presenting my experiences and, and my knowledge uh, of the Pines, you know, these are the very things that caused me to fall in love with it, with the hopes that, you know, others others would too. And, you know, when you when you love something, yeah, you, you don't want to hurt it, generally, you know. Right. So, and, and protect it and care for it. Uh, well, I guess it depends on how, how you would define it, of course. Um, I, I, I don't consider myself uh a piney in the most traditional um sense of the word you know like um i don't i have a a full-time job i don't work the seasons you know like you know i'm not picking blueberries in the summer and cranberries in the fall and you know pine cone and and all that um i think that's um, one of the key characteristics of the traditional piney um is is that aspect of not you know necessarily um you know, uh, at least the formal the formal definition. Uh, um, I I can't say that I've had um, you know that my my family has been in the pines going back to the iron industry. You know, we're, we're relatively new. Like I said, I think the uh, earliest members of our families might have come over in the eighteen eighties. But I don't even know who they are. Um, the ones I know were right about the turn of the century, just a little bit after. So I don't have a, a really long generational, you know, history in the Pines. Um, however, when, once they did settle to the area, that, that area was the Pines. It was, um, you know, not far from Adzon uh, in, in Waterford, um, just on True Road off of 206. Um, and Middle Road in Hamilton was another... Uh, location that they settled if a piney can be someone who is completely uh enthralled with the pines is their passion in life um spends every um possible you know opportunity free time in it you know studying every aspect of it and and just um is um can't be happier anywhere else than and that, under that definition, uh, absolutely. I don't know how far we've come away from um, the negative connotation of that name. Not probably not very far at all. Right. So, so um, if if it were to die now, um, you don't quite have this opportunity to, um, you know, change the perception of that name. You know, as as if we could go forward with it. You know. Definitely in spirit. I was. I'll go through a really quick story. When um, I was a kid, maybe nine, ten, eleven, um, we lived in a different house in town here. But my parents' best friends, uh, the Durunches, lived out in Country Estates. I think it's called. Uh huh. And we would go out there, and the first thing that I was like always enthralled was, you know, their front yard. Most of the backyard was like sand. And the second thing was, you know, when you flush the toilet, it made this sound. And I didn't understand septic at the time, but we always, they used to tell us that there was a whale in their pond thing in the backyard. And I used to kind of believe them because I was a kid. <laughs> um, but, but I knew that being out there was a completely different environment than even Mount Holly. And I loved it. Um, I didn't understand it, but I just thought it was like, it was, I just felt like it was magic out there. When I got my license, and then uh, before I went into the Air Force, after I went in the Air Force, I came back, and um, before I started working for corrections, I would drive out there all the time, the Browns Mills especially, and just go off dirt roads and go sometimes with friends and with a six-pack and just find a, a, a hole, watery hole big enough to swim in. And there's like thousands of them. And, you know, you just park by the side, and cops never came back there, and you have your six-pack or whatever, and you drink for a little while and listen to the radio and then you got up and left and you took everything with you. Um, and so for me, it's, it's what I consider myself a piney. Absolutely. Um, at, at least in spirit, you know, I know I don't live there, but I can't not go out there 
<laughs> I'm drawn to it all the time. And then when I can bring people out there, and I do, like a friend of mine, this last Saturday, it was his first time out there, and he goes, oh, now I get it. And I said, yo, <laughs> you know, he just out of nowhere, he just said that while we're all kayaking. And he goes, now I get it. Because 90% of the time when I go kayaking by myself, that's where I like to go. Um, and, I, and I also walk the trails, you know, and I don't take a lot of the pictures uh, or post a lot of the pictures when I'm walking. So do I consider myself, you know, the short answer, long answer? Because uh, you got a long answer there. Uh, yeah, definitely. Most definitely in spirit. I, I feel the Native American energy out there. Um, I, I, yeah, I have an affinity for it like you wouldn't believe. I, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's pretty enchanting. At our dad's hand we learned Self-respect has to be earned Be proud of who we are He'd often say When you leave this old earth Name you've made is all you're worth Was his legacy When he was called away Since the bulldozers came Town's not the same my home where I'll always be I guess I was a pine from the start proud to be a piney in my heart of the place that I know where the tall pine trees grow and the breezes We've all been led to believe that the Pineys of old are all gone, that they don't exist anymore. I included. Yes, I've believed the half truth too. But I'm here to tell you, Pineys still exist, and the old blood still courses through the veins of our bodies today, like the cedar waters twisting and turning through the creeks and bogs of this land. Not fed by anything outside the Pine Barrens, but from within. Our history is our bridge from yesterday and tomorrow. Today, we celebrate that Pineys are real as much as the New Jersey Pine Barrens still exist, both of which are inseparable. With snowmelt and spring rain, the water levels rise and fall. And over time, one generation of Pineys replaces the one before with the rising and falling of each collective breath. Piney tribe, our hearts are full because we know Piney lives matter. Dried flowers, immortelles, or everlastings reference the nature of these wildflowers to never fade, retaining their form and character. May the life's work of John Richardson and others who were part of one of the longest running industries in America never fade, like that of the everlastings they harvested. Traditions are lost so quickly, yet so hard to regain. They erase the last bastion of the dry floral industry on that hill overlooking Sykesville Road in Wrightstown, New Jersey where the Titan Jack Richardson last lived. The evidence of his passing, along with the old pineys, can be heard in the collection of stories shared here. Like a tumbleweed all dried up and crumbling, the stories of the past are fast fading. Time moves on and forgets all that we are, even the giants that walk amongst us, becoming dust in the wind. The reluctant pineys or woods pineys are near all gone, but the history of the piney and the spirit decor of the remaining types of pineys are ever growing, thus becoming immortal.